Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome you all to this symposium, Voices from the Civic Academic Community, Unique Local Insights and Contributions to Research Policy and Practice, organized by CARA, the Council for At-Risk Academics. Uh, my name is Simon Goldhill. I'm a professor of Greek at the University of Cambridge, and I'm speaking to you today in my capacity as Foreign Secretary of the British Academy, which is the UK body for the humanities and the social sciences, which uh, along with the Royal Society is supporting this important symposium. The symposium was designed with the objective of bringing together the research and humanitarian communities to allow Syrian academics to share their research findings across disciplines, showcase their unique insights, expertise and connections, prompt discussion on issues raised, examine what needs to be done next and by whom, and to develop partnerships and funding opportunities. Uh, the symposium is uh, critical for us to showcase and develop our uh, solidarity with our, our, our uh, with our Syrian colleagues and to highlight the importance of the UK Syrian academic partnerships. And with the symposium, we aim to promote interdisciplinary approaches to strengthen research capacities as well as share knowledge and skills. And in addition to developing a culture of critical inquiry, we hope to reflect on the critical role of Syrian academics in exile and the role they can play in rebuilding Syria. We have an exciting program ahead of us with wide ranging interventions, examining issues of higher education, inequality and displacement and research infrastructure, agriculture and food security. And we hope that these will also, of course, address progress against and challenges associated with advancing the UN's sustainability development goals. I also want to highlight the incredible cultural events which will be taking place on each day and encourage everybody to join those. They're going to focus on women writers, on Syrian cultural heritage, on documenting Syria, and there's also going to be a, a musical performance. And as Foreign Secretary of the British Academy, I am myself particularly pleased to see many contributions from colleagues in the humanities and social sciences, which will help to highlight the importance of those disciplines in building sustainable peace, preventing violence, and understanding the importance of aesthetic cultural representations and reflective practices in building a better society. The Academy is delighted to have worked with CARA and others on the symposium. And by doing so, it actually continues a long working relationship, which started back in 1933, when the president of the British Academy, John William McHale, also a classicist, together with two of his predecessors, Sir Frederick Kenyon and Hal Fisher, and 14 other uh, fellows of the Academy, co-founded CARA's predecessor, the, Acad Acad uh, the Academy Assistance Council, which was then designed to help refugees from Germany prim primarily. As a funding body and a forum for debate, the Academy is also continuing to engage with Syrian academics. And I'm very pleased that we've managed to fund projects on memories from the margins, bottom-up practices for dealing with conflict-reduced heritage in Lebanon, Syria, invisible Syrian immigrants in Turkey, identities and cities in transition, on unbordering heritage and supporting refugee host community integration, and supporting exiled Syrian academics and collaborative research writing. So we put a lot of money into the academic research that we think matters for these problems. And I want to congratulate our Syrian colleagues for this program and colleagues in the UK for supporting the critical symposium. I want to thank Cara for organizing the important symposium and bringing together colleagues across disciplines to help showcase the vitality of Syrian research and reminding us of what is the critical mission of safeguarding academic freedom as well as the individual academics and scientists. And if I can end on a personal note, 
If I can end on a personal note, I'd like to say that for the last five years, I've been hosting a refugee from Syria in my house who arrived on a lorry uh, along with one other person, 12 other people in the lorry died in the transition. He's been with us for five years. He was only 20 when he arrived. And so I've seen up close and in my face really, intense difficulties that can be faced by any exile community. Something I know from my own family background too. And I was point contact for CARA for five years in Cambridge, helping bring academics to Cambridge from the Middle East. And I think it's one of the most important things we can do in an academic community, not just our own research, but to help each other to produce the conditions of academic freedom and the comfort and security to do our best work that's required. It's an incredibly important part of what we do, and I'm very proud to be part of the British Academy work now to support that. So I'll now pass on to Sir Malcolm Grant, a former colleague of mine from Cambridge, nice to see him, who will say a few words and wish you all a wonderful symposium. Well, thank you very much, Simon, for those kind words of introduction. My name is Malcolm Grant. I'm the president of CARA. And I would just like to reflect, Simon, on your closing comments and to thank you on behalf of CARA for having been our point person in Cambridge uh, for so long, but also your very moving story about hosting in your own home uh, a, a Syrian refugee, which brings home to you and of course to all of us the sheer atrocity of the Syrian situation and the population which is often so hard hit by it, which is the academic population. We know that one of the jobs of academic populations is to speak freely and to be critical. And this is clearly an invitation to trouble in regimes which are not warmly welcoming of freedom of speech. But more broadly, may I, introducing the symposium on behalf of CARA, thank both the British Academy and the Royal Society, not only for sponsoring this symposium, but also for all the work that they have done on the Syria program to date, and indeed, across the whole of the history of CARA. On that note, let me say something about the history of CARA, building on the comments that Simon has already given us. It goes back to 1933. There was a dark cloud coming over the whole of Europe and William Beveridge who was then the director of the London School of Economics, but subsequently, of course, became a hugely influential leader of post-war uh, social policy across Britain, including unemployment benefit, uh, including social security, and including the foundation of the National Health Service. But Beveridge was traveling in Austria in 1933 when he learned of the Nazi authorities' decree which was dismissing many leading academics from German universities on racial and political grounds. He returned to the UK and he set about enlisting the support of prominent academics, scientists and others for an urgent rescue mission. So this was the Academic Assistance Council, the AAC that Simon has referred to. And it was launched in May, 1933. Its founding statement, I think, still rings true today. It appealed for the means to prevent the waste of exceptional abilities, exceptionally trained. The first president was the Nobel Prize winning chemist and physicist Ernest Rutherford, a New Zealander, as, as it happens, and he was then joined by A.V. Hill, uh, originally a UCL scientist who then later also became a Nobel Prize winning scientist and later also, oddly enough, the Cambridge University MP. He became the vice president. This is, this is a lovely early story because it then was from a humble beginning, from rooms actually in the Royal Society 
1933, the committee raised nearly £10,000 to get its work off the ground. And that, by the way, is around £350,000 in today's values. Most of it came from UK academics, most of it from UK academics. And I have to say, that is still a major skein of the weaving of the fabric of the modern Cara. UK academics willing uh, to put an investment into the assistance of academics from around the world. In, in October 1933, there was a major fundraising event at the Royal Albert Hall. And um, Albert Einstein, in his last public speech in Europe, before leaving for the USA, urged his audience to stand up for intellectual and individual freedom. I just, I just want to read out his words because I think that they are even more resonant in today's divided world. He said, if we want to resist the powers which threaten to suppress intellectual and individual freedom, we, we must keep clearly before us what is at stake and what we owe to that freedom, which our ancestors have won for us after hard struggles. Without such freedom, there would have been no Shakespeare, no Goethe, no Newton, no Faraday, no Pasteur, and no Lister. Most people would lead a dull life of slavery. It is only men and women who are free to create the inventions and intellectual works, which to us moderns makes life worthwhile. Post-1933, Cara, in its then existence helped many distinguished scientists and scholars to escape Nazi Germany. 16 of them became Nobel laureates and many more became leaders in their own fields. Names such as Karl Popper, Marx Perutz, who ran the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, and whose son, Robin, is chairing our session on energy security here on day three. Robin, currently a professor at the University of York. It included also Ernst Chain, Nicholas Pesner, Ernest Gombridge, and Hans Krebs, some of the great names of British scholarship and British science of their time. So, Almost 90 years on from then, Cara is continuing to provide a lifeline to academics at risk. Wherever and whenever world events place them in the line of fire. We can cite the Hungarian uprising, the Cold War, apartheid South Africa, Latin America and Junta, Rwandan genocide, and most recently, the Middle East, including Iraq and Syria. Simon made his own personal connection to Cara. I, I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to reflect on an incident 50 years ago. I arrived in the United Kingdom from my native New Zealand to take up a one year temporary assistant lectureship job at the University of Southampton. I found amongst my new colleagues, an outstanding individual who was a CARA beneficiary.
his name was and is L.B. Sachs. L.B. Sachs had fought apartheid as a young lawyer in South Africa. He had been jailed for 90 days of solitary confinement under the harsh laws that then existed in the apartheid regime. Upon release from jail, he was immediately rearrested and jailed for another 90 days, in both cases without trial. He managed at the end of that ordeal to escape from South Africa and with the help of Cara, was brought to the United Kingdom and to, in due course, his role as a lecturer in the University of Southampton. He had already written two books. He wrote a book called Stephanie on Trial about the experience of his then wife being prosecuted under the apartheid rules. And he wrote a second book called Jail Diary about his experience of solitary confinement. That became a film, it became a West End play, and it did a great deal to highlight here in the West the ordeals of those who challenged apartheid in South Africa. After a few years, Albie Sachs decided that he would return to the struggle and went to Mozambique to work with the African National Congress. During that period when he was being closely tracked by the South African Special Police, a bomb was attached to his car. When he went to open the door, the bomb exploded. He was seriously injured. He lost, he lost an arm altogether. Uh, his sight was damaged. His hearing was damaged. Kara came to the rescue again. Kara secured his evacuation from Mozambique, brought him to the United Kingdom, his hospital treatment, and his eventual rehabilitation. I think that Elby remains the only person to whom Kara has reached out twice and in such a dramatic manner. With the overthrow of the apartheid regime, he returned to South Africa as a hero. He was appointed by Nelson Mandela to the new constitutional court of South Africa, where he completed a full term as a leading jurist, shaping the future structure of the Constitution of South Africa. I hold this out always in my mind as a vivid living example of what an organization like CARA can actually do and the sheer importance of what it does. And so to the Syria program, this demonstrates a significant change in the approach of CARA. The nature of global conflict is so different now from what it was in 1939 and what it was with South Africa. CARA is no longer focused exclusively on rescuing academic refugees and integrating them into British academic life. Much more needs now to be done to support those who are in exile, either internally or in another country, but who hold out, hold out the hope that they will in due course be able to be returned to their original country and to participate in the renaissance of its civic affairs. Most of the Syrian Academics who are currently in exile in Turkey or in Lebanon or elsewhere intend to return to Syria when they can. But for now, they urgently need opportunities to work and to continue to grow professionally through a very difficult time. So they will be able to help rebuild a better system of higher education when they do go back.
in several countries, academics are at serious risk, subject to repression, to loss of civil liberties, loss of personal liberty, even loss of life. But where Kara's principal contribution must be by support and networking rather than in escape and refuge. We have to, of course, remember that in some countries, escape to the West is virtually impossible. There is, for those academics who challenge to strenuously, no civil rights, no passports, let alone a visa to travel. Our colleagues in these countries face internal confinement and often imprisonment, or they may be locked into an internal and unsafe combat zone. So the modern approach, the remodeled approach of CARA is to frame its support as temporary sanctuary offered at times of heightened risk. The Syria program, which has now been running for five years, draws and builds on the Kara Iraq program, which ran from 2006 to 2012. The aim of the Syrian program now is explicitly to sustain Syrian academics and to facilitate future opportunities by strengthening and connecting them and enabling their continued academic engagement. Their continued academic engagement as a group that's vital for the future of Syria. It remains the only program that solely and systematically supports Syrian academics in the region who have been directly affected by the crisis. We recognize that this group who are being supported have a vital role to play in the future of Syria's higher education and research. In the training of future generations of doctors, of teachers, of engineers, of lawyers, of architects and other disciplines. And, and, and as a consequence, in the future development of a stable, pluralist society. The, the program owes a huge debt to all those who are giving so freely of their time, of their expertise and their energy to ensure its success. The various strands of the program will be on display over these five days of this symposium. So let me try to break down what it is the Syria program has been able to achieve. I would say number one is a facilitation role. Facilitating Syrian academics trying to sustain themselves professionally with disadvantaged profiles in a disadvantaging environment. Here is a major role for UK and other academics to sustain the Syrian colleagues. And then alongside that, facilitating their integration and engagement with the wider regional and the wider global academic and scientific community. And with, and with a very different academic culture. And also alongside this, facilitating the collective need as Syrian academics and researchers contribute to and to be part of the future of Syria, future of Syria in the immediate and the longer term. I guess, and also at a more individual level, it's facilitating Syrian academics to reclaim their academic identities, connecting them not just to colleagues in, the, in these wider regional and academic communities, but also to each other. And, and the critical thing about this is that, of course, they are often geographically spread and isolated, widely dispersed. 
This is a group whose potency for the future is amplified the more that they can be held together during the times of conflict. And there are many other studies over the coming five days that will demonstrate how facilitating the equal engagement of Syrian academics and research team members has been advanced through the programme. So Cara fully understands that there is an issue here about exclusion and neglected resources. We've, we've, we've got a particular issue here that new research funding tends to come online for which academics from the West compete with little or no or far too little engagement with local academics and their expertise. And the consequences that they become the object rather than the partner, again, an area for focus for the Syria program. And this is going to be demonstrated over the next few days in highlighting the importance of local knowledge, of local expertise, and of local networks. The, the majority of the studies we're going to see over the next five days focus on the non-regime controlled north of Syria, which remains a conflict area and an area to which academics in exile have access. Unlike most international NGOs and UN agencies, connections and networks. So there is a focus here of geographical as well as intellectual expertise. So, Why is this symposium such an important event? I would say after five years, there is so much to showcase and so much to demonstrate. We are going to be able to learn from our Syrian academics, from their research findings and from their recommendations. And they're sharing these findings with an audience from the academic and humanitarian sectors. We're going to be able to highlight the importance of their unique insights, given their local knowledge, their expertise, their connections and their collaborations. I hope also that we can prompt discussion on the issues that have been raised, that we can prompt discussion on what needs to be done next and by whom, that we can prompt new partners and we can engage funders and follow up work. And really importantly, to get Syrian higher education and its tertiary educators back on the international agenda. So it's a celebration also, it's a celebration of the work of Syrian academics after a decade of adversity. It's a celebration of the extraordinary diversity of research that is being carried out under the Cara Syrian program umbrella. And I have to say this, it's, it's a celebration of what you can achieve with relatively modest grants. We've been seeing that grants of average seven and a half thousand pounds, maximum 10,000 pounds can achieve an extraordinary amount in this environment. These academics who will be presenting at the symposium are not just a group with a vital role to play in the future, not just that, but a role that many are playing right now in sustaining access to higher education for local and displaced populations in the non-regime controlled north. Many international higher education initiatives by responders to the crisis who had no basic mandates for education were driven by fear of radicalization. So that is one aspect of trying to stem feared radicalization by investing in higher education. But what we need to be doing, and we are doing through Cara, is thinking about developing the next gender generation. 
I'm going to give a quote from Dr. Abdulkader Rashwani, who is participating in this seminar on Friday. He says the following, I am one of many Syrian academics who have been working in the conflict area as Northwest Syria. For five years, I have tirelessly crossed the border from my exile in Turkey to help develop an educated generation capable of rebuilding the country once the war ends. This symposium offers an important opportunity for my voice to be heard in an international forum. I want, on behalf of CARA, to give grateful thanks to the Syria Programme's funders, the Andrew Mellon Foundation and the OSF, Open Society Foundation. This important work couldn't take place without them, nor with the many UK-based academics who have given so much of their time to support the programme both financially and also in acts of solidarity with their Syrian colleagues. We continue to need much more such support to continue to facilitate Syrian-led research, develop new partnerships, to expand on these studies, and to develop and implement recommended strategies. We are simply so grateful to everybody who has helped the program to date. I hope that many of you will be able to follow the events of today and the following four days, that you will make time for contributing to the important dates through the Q&A sessions and also for the cultural sessions every evening. So today we've got sessions on societal challenges, on gender, tomorrow on displacement, integration and education, on disability, and on Syrian cultural heritage. For Wednesday, the overall theme is operationalizing research to help rebuild Syria's infrastructure. On Thursday, Syrian food futures, agriculture, food security. Friday, partnership for the goal of quality higher education. In conclusion, let me just say how grateful I am to all the participants in the symposium. And to those who are chairing the sessions from the British Academy, we've heard from Simon Goldhill this morning, and the Royal Society, where Robin Grimes will be speaking later in the week. And also from distinguished UK and foreign scholars and scientists. Sessions will also be chaired by my colleague, Michael Wharton, who is the chair of the Council of Cairo. But above all, I want to close by expressing huge thanks to Kate Robertson. Kate has been the tireless and committed leader of the Syria program. She is an extraordinary dynamo. She's done an outstanding job in drawing together, not just this symposium, but the whole of the Syria program. And on behalf of CARA, its council and all of its members, I'd like to put on record our huge and grateful thanks to her for all that she has done. It has been a program, not just of theory, but of impact uh, and of success. I now conclude my remarks by handing over to Professor Elaine Onterholter from the Institute of Education at UCL to chair the session on societal challenges. Thank you. <laughs>